Hi, I'm Stuart and welcome to our podcast, The More You Know. Our podcast will be looking into how the manufacture of semiconductors interacts with our everyday life. As you know, in our podcast, we're always lucky to have some very special guests, but I have to say that we have an incredible special guest today and a friend for, oh, I'm not allowed to mention how many years, joining us. Uh, my guest today um, has carried out some amazing research into areas of microplastics and their distribution, extensive work into greenhouse gas emissions in industry, and worked on sustainable development and an education of sustainable development. Um, she's an associate fellow of the Higher Education of Academy. I do believe that an acronym must come in here, the AFHEA. And she's had, as I said before, significant experience in cur curriculum development and delivery. And she was part of the team that won the Green Gown Award for Next Education, Learning and Teaching. Eleni, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to you. Uh, I know it's your podcast, but I will also be welcoming you. I'm also sad that I don't get to introduce you. Maybe that's something that we can consider for other podcasts. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it it sounds it sounds like you have covered everything. I have forgot something. Where do, where are you working at the moment? Because the last time I saw you, it was Bristol when you were finished. You'd finished your PhD. Yes. So for the last uh, three and something years now, I'm working for and with the Stockholm Environment Institute or SEI, as I will be referring to it from, from now on, um, is an international not-profit research and policy organization. This is how we call ourselves. And basically what this means is that we like to work on that space between science and policy, that overlap between science and policy. Um, something that we really like to do that we're really focusing on in different areas in different topics is how do you go from producing the scientific research or participating in the scientific research to implementing it in what we call the real world you know how do you make your work how do you make your research have impact and change things on different levels um so this is SEI um, SEI does have quite a lot of centers. So currently I'm based in the SEI York. So that is with the University of York. But SEI has centers in the UK, obviously, the US, Africa, Latin America, Asia. Um, and our headquarters are in Sweden. So very often when I introduce myself to someone um, and I'll say I'm with the Stockholm Environment Institute at the University of York, they generally don't know where I am physically, which is something I enjoy. <laughs> It's, um, I must admit, I was surprised when uh, my colleague met you out in San Francisco recently and said, oh, I met a good friend of yours. She's working for the Stockholm Institute. And I'm like, what in Stockholm? And she went, New York. So now I understand why. Um, our topic today is going to be clean air. But um, one of the things I'm really interested before we get into clean air, there's a lot of scepticism around at the moment around the science of around climate change in fact anything scientists say at the moment how how does the stockholm um, environmental institute what kind of how do you overcome that challenge where we just talked about before we came on air here about you could go to anywhere on the internet a scientist says something and you could have a climate denier somewhere else um, I'm starting to think of another podcast here, uh, Eleni. But um, how, how does the Stockholm Environmental Institute, how, how, do you, how do you do it? You say it comes into policy, but with so many climate deniers, not only in the mainstream, and, you know, just on the fringes, but actually in the mainstream and often in sometimes government policy. How does it overcome that? So that's a very interesting question. And I won't be answering, you know, on behalf of the entirety of SEI, which includes a lot of researchers. Um, but so I will just be answering as as myself, as as Eleni. You know what's very interesting in, in this discussion? I don't think that there is any problem without a solution. That's just something that uh, maybe, you know, you can call it my motto, my mantra, whatever. So I don't think that there is a problem without a solution. I just think that there are solutions that we are have not explored yet, uh, have not engaged with yet. So even in that instance, you know, even when we're talking about 
um, you know, climate change deniers or or what you spoke about, you know, just that denial in general uh, when mm-hmm. it comes to science and scientific comments. I still think that depending on who is the denier, depending on who that person is, depending on their background, depending on their core beliefs, there is still a way to engage them. Um, I don't know to what extent this can happen very quickly. You know, I don't know to what extent people can change their minds uh, when it comes to these sort of issues as urgently as we probably need them to Mm. for the type Mm. of emergency that we are dealing with. Um, which I think, you know, it's quite an important parameter here. Um, but I still believe, and I've seen it in practice, that people can change what they were previously thinking of and be informed by new information, new evidence. Um, this is a part of the literature that I find very fascinating, quite frankly. Um, you know, we were looking into that when we were putting together the sustainable development uh, course for the University of Bristol. <clears throat> Um, I've engaged with this with one of my personal heroes, uh, James Ladyman. He is in he's a professor of philosophy at the University of Bristol. There, there is a lot of interesting information out there for people to understand where that block can be coming from. And mm. I genuinely do think that you need to understand the blockage before you set off to deal with it. It's just that there are different types, there are different levels, there are different people. And the time that we have left is is a very important parameter in this discussion. As a researcher, I just think you need to know that you need to be aware that this is something that's happening. You need to be very patient with people, with everyone. Uh, You need to be very... You need to be moderating your own reactions. I don't think, you know, anger works. I don't think attacks work. I don't think diminishing the way people think works. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of researchers out there that are working on their own resilience when they are trying to engage with audiences like that, which I also find very fascinating. So that is actually ideal because this is what our podcast is. I think to give a voice to everyone in that discussion we had earlier on about greenwashing and now get a better understanding of what we were talking about. So this brings us on to clean air and and air pollution. And recently it's been in a lot of politics from wildfires to uh, cities bringing in clean air zones. And there was a bit of an uproar in London recently. And I saw the Paris mayor and I think was one of the mayors in Toronto came out in defence of the London mayor saying clean air zones are really important. And that's what I really want to uh, investigate today. But what I realised is, what is clean air? You know, I was just recently cycling up to the north of Scotland and there's very clean air up there. You know, there's, there's no one there, there's no cars there and you're just on your bicycle cycling and the air's very clean. What is clean air? So, okay, so let me just be super cheeky for a while, which I can do because I'm Greek. <laughs> Uh, I'll just flip that question around and say, what is clean in general? So never mind clean air. What is clean? I mean, um, for for my work, I travel a lot. Um, I spend quite a lot of my time on on you know Gatwick Airport uh, the airport's floor, and it looks clean, but like, mm. is it <clears throat> clean? You know, if something. Uh, fell like if your if your sandwich fell on the floor, would you just pick it up and say, "Well, that looks clean to me. Like I might as well have it." So our, I think that this is. I've very- just got this image of you searching for sandwiches in Gatwick Airport. As, rather than pay, I'm just going to pick them off the floor. These look clean. These look clean. I'm I'm sorry, but I consider myself an expert camper when it comes to Gatwick Airport. I know exactly where to be. I've got like a mini tent. I do not like outdoor camping because I'm scared of bugs. But camping at the airport, I'm a total pro. <laughs> but I think that the question is interesting because it also links to our perception of clean. You you mentioned earlier when you were doing the introduction for me that I've worked on microplastics as well. And, and I think that that's where I made that connection. People could be swimming in a sea that looks like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Instagram worthy and TikTok worthy and so, so blue and serene and beautiful. And, and you're thinking, oh, my God, I took samples from that place yesterday and it's just horrible. And you just want to run up and down the beach and just scream to people like, get out, get out. But obviously yeah, yeah. what they see 
versus what you know about the content of that super beautiful, like crystal clear water are very different things. So, you know, what is clean air? What what is clean? Clean is is I mean, let's let's take a health um impact view to our definition of clean. I would assume that something that we deem as clean is something that can no longer harm us, mm -hmm. you know, our health, mm -hmm. our lives, the environment, the ecosystem. Um, so that means that clean is something that does not expose you to dangers. Is anything 100% clean? I doubt that. Will anything be 100% clean like ever? I also doubt that. I think there is a very famous meme where that brand that shall not be named, that is an antibacterial brand that deals with 99.9% .9 of bacteria. So the meme shows that it leaves that 0.1% alive to go and tell the others what will happen <laughs> if they come across that <laughs> disinfectant. So, so clean air, you know, clean air, what is clean air? Clean air is that air that no longer harms people, their mm -hmm. lives, uh, their health to that extent where it leads to premature mortality, it leads to acute disease, asthma. It's funny you said that my friend Peter, um, and he wanted me to name check Peter, He's, he started to watch the podcast, but Peter and I had a trip to the Falkland Islands many years ago and Peter was becoming very unfit when we were living in the UK. But when we got off the plane... In um, in Port Stanley, or it might be in Mount Pleasant in the Falklands, the air was so fresh. And within three weeks, he didn't suffer. It might have been three weeks, uh, but definitely by halfway through the two months, he had no asthma and he was out running and he was getting a bit slim. And um, and it, I think that for me, the clean air was, and I mentioned Scotland at the, the, the front end, but it does have a health effect. He didn't suffer from asthma and and his his weight came down in his whole thing. So... What are the things that um, um, affect clean air from the natural stuff or the unnatural aspects? I'm assuming that by unnatural you mean like human activities. Yes, or yes. Not the supernatural. Yes. Okay, See, that's, this that's, is that's, why I'm, you're the smart person and I'm not. You're able to decipher, one, my Scottish accent and two, what my question's all about. It's fine. I mean, I did get slightly psyched there that we would be talking about the supernatural as well and how that contributes to, to clean air. But maybe, maybe that's another podcast, like a late night podcast. <laughs> I really want to go down this line of the supernatural, but maybe the next podcast. <laughs> so... Um, clean air. Okay. So anyone who is listening to this podcast and they're listening to other podcasts, they will have heard about things like emissions. Normally in the media, you know, we talk about greenhouse gas emissions and by that we normally mean CO2. Um, sometimes we also mean methane. For when we talk about clean air, we usually talk about air pollutants. So we talk about things like particulate matter, um, which can come in like small and not so small sizes, so 2.5, PM 2.5 and PM 10. Uh, we talk about black carbon. Um, and, and these, you know, very much like CO2, right? Mm -hmm. CO2 mm -hmm. does occur naturally. It has natural um, sources. But what we are looking into, um, at least within the SEI, why SEI York, so SEI Y team, is those pollutants that are occurring from unnatural um, activities. So anything to do with um, energy combustion or transport or agriculture or waste. So these, these are what we call, you know, key emitting sectors of these substances, these air pollutants that we are focusing on. Um, depending on what these activities are, uh, depending on where, uh, these activities take place, like geographically, um, the magnitude of the emissions differ, of course. And I think, you know, and and some of the things or some of these things we also know empirically, right, from our own experience. Um, you know, if you're if you were born in the 80s, so just a small clap for my 80s people listening to this. So if you were born in the 80s, you still remember that you probably had a truck right in front of you when you were going away for holidays and it was spewing out that you know, just proper evil uh, cloud of... Nice puff of smoke to tell you the car in front of you is moving on or the bus, yeah. Exactly, you know, and your father would say, 
uh, everyone closed the windows now and then you would have to put the air condition on and no one was really happy about that. So anyway, so <laughs> empirically, you know, we, we can see, we've seen how these activities are emitting these substances. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we've known this from our own experience, from everyday experience, and this is what we are focusing on in, in SCI. And something that I think is very interesting when we're talking about air pollution or air quality, you know, which is a more um, like positive way perhaps of talking about mm -hmm. air pollution, is that people like your friend, you know, people will have some experience yeah. with that. Yeah. But if you if you take that experience that people may have and you map it onto our perception of what clean might be, you may get instances where people will say, but I don't have an issue here. You mm. know, this this looks fine to me. Um, and, you know, this is very interesting. I mean, sometimes in Athens, we will get um, like smoggy incidents, mm -hmm. especially in the winter where people are burning all sorts of things for heating. Um, you know, in, in the in their houses, so the residential sector is what we identify that source as. You can actually see it, and when you can see it, it's on the news. I was looking at a very good presentation recently on the impact of premature deaths, and the, could you give the listeners a kind of idea of the impact of not having clean air? You know, like um, you know. We always hear about alcoholism. We always hear about um, HIV and AIDS. But have you got some kind of figures that kind of gives a scale to the challenge around um, air pollution and how it affects us as humans? So I was I was trying to avoid, um, you know, some of the very doom and gloom numbers, but air pollution is the largest environmental risk to public health globally. So that is the largest environmental risk to public health globally. Um, the exposure of people to air pollution, you know, in the workplace, when they're traveling to work, when they're staying in their homes, um, has led to the very famous, you know, WHO number. And by WHO, I mean World Health Organization number, uh, where they're talking about particulate matter and how it has caused an estimated 7 million premature deaths mm. a year that's frightening figure isn't it it was the it was a great presentation i saw like the okay i'll admit it was yours but um <laughs> but that figure really astounded me when i saw it when you know i think you gave a statistic it's three times more i'm sorry i'm looking at my notes here three times more than alcohol or unsafe water in the world and it's really quite alarming that figure and there was recently as i mentioned earlier that that discussion and it became political about people feeling as if there's an attack on cars but when you put it into you know about car use and extending the ultra clean air zones that they want to bring in but when you hear that statistic seven million premature deaths you know and four and a half million from outdoor air pollution am i correct i think that is astounding that is the size of london every year the population, you know, the Greek population living in Greece, mm, we are mm. 10, maybe 11 million. Yeah, yeah. So that should give, you know, some, like the scale, you know, the magnitude comparatively yeah, to yeah. all the Greeks living in Greece. Well, it's the whole right? of Scotland. Every year you wipe out the whole of Scotland. And some people might think that's a good thing, but not me, because I'm Scottish. Like the, um, But that figure's huge. It's, it, it's just really... You know, from my point of view, always in the podcast, we come to the part, where, well, what's industry doing about it? What can the consumer do about it? And as an individual, what we can do? Can we, can we look a bit of a focus on what, taking into account, it's, you know, when you think of these premature deaths, et cetera, what's industry, and, and, and particularly in the, the areas you're working in, what's industry trying to do to, let's say, clean up the act? All right, okay. Uh, so this is, I'm going to tell a story now. It, it sort of has like a couple of parallel stories, like some stories going on, kind of like Game of Thrones, but, but um, I'm going to get to the point at the end. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which I'll be referring to as the CCAC, a child of UNEP, who is the UN, uh, the UN's mm -hmm. environmental program, 
Um, so the CCAC and IKEA, they co-funded a project. IKEA, the, the furniture yeah, people, actually, people. Yeah, 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 actually, yeah. The, the company, IKEA. So no acronym mm-hmm. here. So the CCAC and IKEA, before COP26, right, they were having this interesting discussion about how we as SEI and they as CCAC were working on air pollution, focusing a lot on the national level. Uh, we were working a lot with national governments, helping them uh, prepare their national determined contributions, which they submit to the UN. We, we call it the UNFCCC. Uh, so that's a very long phrase, but we don't need that level of detail. And and what we were saying was, you know, in those discussions, it just came up and we said, actually, you know, how come the private sector is not reporting on their air pollutant emissions as the governments are, you know, on the national level, uh, which is what we um, do when we're working with mm-hmm. the countries. Mm-hmm. And where we landed with that discussion was actually there was no guidance for the private sector to do that. For yeah, greenhouse yeah. gas emissions, you probably have, you know, the greenhouse gas protocol. There may be other protocols out there or other guidances like the ISO potentially that people are using. Um, so we said, OK, you know, that seems like a, an interesting enough project. Why don't we create a guide that allows the private sector to quantify their emissions? And this is where we started from. Uh, we started putting the guide together with the team in SCI. Um, and at the same time, the World Economic Forum was considering um, forming and launching an, an alliance, um, a coalition. Can, can I just ask, the World Economic Forum, just, um, just explain quickly what the World Economic Forum is? The World Economic Forum is another uh, organization. So they are an independent international organization uh, that are working with uh, businesses. They're working with governments. Uh, they right. have, okay. yeah, they have a very broad agenda. Um, so that is that is the World Economic Forum, and you know we they wanted to convene an an alliance, so a coalition of companies that would be specifically looking into their air pollutant emissions. The Alliance for Clean Air that was uh, put together by the World Economic Forum, but also funded by the Clean Air Fund, um, it was launched in COP26 and it included companies like Google, Ikea, Siemens, Bloomberg, Accenture, uh, go to, you know, really, really big companies. Mm -hmm. We had 10 Mm -hmm. founding members. We now have 16 companies. And the focus of the Alliance is for the private sector companies, you know, members of the Alliance to quantify and reduce their air pollutant emissions. They quantify using the guide, the SCI guide, which is absolutely freely available um, on the CCAC website. So they quantify using the guide. And once we have those inventories, they then incorporate them into their sustainability reports, which is something that has never happened before. Uh, Currently, we have five companies with um, inventories uh, integrated in their sustainability reports, uh, namely IKEA, Myers, GoTo, Biogen and Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. And what Mm -hmm. happens then, because, of course, you know, you can't reduce what you haven't or what you can't measure. So once we have that, we work with the companies to develop mitigation pathways, um, you know, um, look into the reductions that can be achieved from their existing strategies, their existing policies, and try to identify what does a reduction target, but for air pollution, look like for the private sector. What part do semiconductors play in there? Is the semiconductor industry playing? Because we are targeting our semiconductor industry as well in this podcast. Um, is is semi playing any part in this discussion? Yes. So, I mean, absolutely. Um, well, starting from the fact that we have, uh, you know, companies like Siemens and Google already as founding mm-hmm. members mm-hmm. of of the alliance. The you know this the semi conductor world, the semiconductor ecosystem, has a very, very critical role to play in this work, much as it has in the greenhouse gas reduction work. You know, the the semiconductor companies or the the semiconductor ecosystem, they are a super critical part of the green transition. They are a super critical part of this next phase, you know, that we... Mm -hmm. Um, mention as either net zero or climate positive or whichever name we are 
um, giving to that next phase that we all understand we need to be parts of, the semiconductor ecosystem has a super critical role to play to play here. As a key player in that next phase of our collective, you know, uh, futures on this planet, um, air pollution coming from their activities uh, or the links between air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, I genuinely think that it's something that the companies need to be engaging with. And and maybe this is part of my pitch, you know, maybe. Uh, but something I really wanted to say is that sometimes we've talked about, you know, including the air pollution work in, in their sustainability reports with companies. And, you know, we do get some concerns, right, which are very fair. Concerns like... Um, will I have the data? Do I have enough capacity? Is it going to be difficult? You know, is it going to take me forever to understand this? We have set up the guide to be like an add-on to what the companies are already doing for the greenhouse gas emissions reporting. Mm -hmm. Um, We are providing um, technical support to the companies, like a lot of technical support uh, tailored to fit the needs of the company. And we try to be super respectful of everyone's, you know, workload and other priorities. So, one thing I just wanted to say is that if someone who is listening to this podcast is interested in that, um, but they do have worries, please reach out You know, to me directly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really important that this discussion on air pollution becomes normalized yeah. in the yeah. semiconductor world. Yeah, no, I, I, it's funny because um, obviously I know the work you did in your PhD working with Professor Cherniak. And, um, you know, the big focus in our podcast, we've talked about PFCs, we've talked about greenhouse gases, we've even talked about another great acronym, PFAS. But the, the, and when the teams met you out in San Francisco in the clean air and they said this would be a great idea, people talk about clean air, but they're not really sure what it means. And I think with this recent, as we brought before, the arguments about car use and being, as some people say, penalised or actually, you know, the benefits, I think, that's one thing, I think, the benefits of clean air, and we kind of touched on it when we talked about my friend Peter doing a name check again, and his asthma disappearing. I read a statistic from another great presentation, actually, it was still yours, but it was something like 99% of all the global population breathe air that exceeds the WHO guidelines limits on pollution. Taken into that, I'll say it again, actually, 99% of the global population breathe air that exceeds the WHO guidelines out of the guideline limits on pollution. That's frightening. But then that kind of ties in with how many people have premature deaths. If we did address these, what's the benefits of actually addressing clean air? Oh, well, well, I mean, I I don't even know where to start from, right? I mean, you've got, first of all, you've got the, the reduced expected premature deaths associated with this, yeah, right? Yeah. So top of the list over there is saving lives. Um, People are less sick potentially, or at least uh, when it comes to that part of acute disease and chronic disease that is connected to exposure to air pollution, you know, specifically. Um, So that is reduced, that danger and that exposure is reduced as well. Um, There are economic impacts related to air pollution. It has a very high cost related to human health, lost productivity, reduced crop yields. Uh, So there is a a World Bank study from 2021, if I remember correctly, where they found that the economic cost of just the health impacts of air pollution was 8.1 trillion US dollars. Sorry, trillion US dollars. Trillion, yeah, Mm. 8.1. 8.1. 8.1. Um, air pollution is very, very strongly linked to climate change. Um, I mean, because some of these air pollutants are also powerful, powerful mm-hmm. climate forcers. So you have those benefits as well coming from that, you know, link between air pollution and climate change. Air pollution is very, very much linked to development and the economy. So that links to the sustainable development goals. Uh, goals like good health and well-being, affordable and clean energy, uh, climate change, of course. So there are there is such a multitude of benefits coming from the reduction mm-hmm. of air pollution, um, even links to agriculture, you know, and and food systems. There are so many benefits when it comes to strategies that are really focusing on reducing air pollution. 
I, I've, I've got this pet peeve, right? Sometimes we, and by we, I mean humans, you know, we, we make a plan to reduce something, but then because of quite a lot of reasons, which are very well documented in the literature, we, we get what we uh, refer to as unintended consequences. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, I think microplastics are a, a good and recent example of these unintended consequences. So something that I feel very strongly about is having this level of emergency that we have at the moment, you know, existential threats coming from climate change, biodiversity loss, all, all sorts of things. Like living in that in that state of emergency that we live at the moment, we should be thinking about more holistic solutions. And I know that the word holistic is a buzzword yeah. and, you know, it just goes around everywhere. But you can deal with air pollution as you are dealing with your greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that to me, like someone not doing that is such a missed opportunity because they are putting th- things in place to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutant emissions have common sources. Yeah, we used to have a saying, uh, one of our scientists used to always say, you have a choice. You could either produce acid rain or you could produce greenhouse gases. I think times have moved on now. We need to deal with both of them, in theory. We need a solution to to time with both of them. If I was to ask, if I was to say to you, I want to go out now and I want to do something about clean air, what are... Could you give me as a, an individual, a consumer, um, and we'll keep out of politics who would I vote on and who I wouldn't vote on to get clean air, but from a practical point of view, um, what would you say for me a best practice? One thing to go out and to start to do tomorrow. Oh, okay. So if it's just, if it's just the one thing, mm-hmm. then I would say transport. I would say transport is the one, you know, think that people can potentially switch from a car and I don't mean replacing their car but I mean people can cycle more they can use public transport more I think this is something that you can do you know right away yeah, that yeah. doesn't come with an associated you know economic burden um and it's it also comes with co-benefits for your own health as well yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you are reducing your own contribution to a challenge, but you're also improving your own, you know, health and well-being by by doing that. Eleni, I'm going to have to ask you to give another one because I'm no one's going to believe um, you now because I'm already doing that. Today was my misdemeanor coming on, a, on the car, but I do cycle to work. So is there another one? Because I know the production team are sitting there going now, He's going to go on about my hybrid bicycle again, and because I keep telling him not to buy a hybrid bicycle, buy a proper road bike. But is is there another one outside of cycling? Just because I'm already doing that. So okay, so another thing, but this is probably something that people are already doing. But I'll just highlight it anyway. Another thing is just being mindful of the energy that we use in our own homes. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, being mindful of that, um, even reducing our waste helps. <laughs> I think these would be the three, you know, three key things. Um, yeah. Our energy consumption, the way we choose to to move around um, and the amount of waste that we are generating, particularly if we are living in, you know, certain areas where the disposal and treatment has some specific characteristics. But these are the three key, three key things that I would highlight. And these are... Very much, you know, the three key things that are also highlighted when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions as well. Yes, yeah. Eleni, th- thank you for today. I think it's great to finish the podcast on such a positive note on what us as an individual can do and the the stuff that industry is looking to do. And and maybe we could catch up um, soon for that beer that we've been promising. I do think it's my round. But once again, thank you, Eleni, for coming in today and chatting to us about... Um, the research and what that you're looking to do. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, if I could just just one final comment because I think it's important. If people listen to this podcast and they find themselves overwhelmed, they find themselves worrying too much, they find themselves thinking that this is yet another thing that they have to deal with or think about or stresses them or feel guilty about, one more advice for what the individual can do. 
talk to your friends about air pollution, about climate change, normalize this discussion so that you feel less alone and less weird for worrying about these things. We all worry about these things at one level or another, and unless all of us, you know, weird people don't come together to join our forces and talk about this and feel okay about how we feel not okay, we will keep feeling not okay for a while. So talk to your friends, link up to people that care about these things, reach out to researchers, we're all pretty chilled people. So don't feel alone. We are all dealing with that. Thank you for having what me. What a great way. Thank you. Thank you, Eleni.